Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. So we're doing this series now where we're trying to see the different working groups of the PhD net. We did cover the steering group roles in the previous two episodes. So if you haven't listened to that, listen to that right now. We'll wait. No, we're not going to wait. But still, just go listen to the steering group episodes. And now we have the working group episodes where we're going to interview the coordinators of the different working groups of the Max Planck PhD net and try to understand why they're so important and also to see how they function and what their tasks are. So in this episode we're going to have four different working group coordinators from the web group, the survey group, the vision and science group as well as the equal opportunities group. So stay tuned for all of that and it's going to be a slightly fragmented episode unlike the previous ones that we've done till now. So I'll be giving brief introductions of the person that we're going to be interviewing and their current role in between each interview. So so I hope this made any sense. If not, pardon me. And without any further ado, let's get on with this discussion to understand the different working groups of the Max Planck PhD net. Welcome to the Offspring Podcast, guys. Uh, I have with me here Mele Uker and Andrea Boers from the web group. Uh, thanks for joining us. So as a quick uh, first question, can you please introduce yourself and uh, uh, talk about talk a little about the work group that you're coordinating? Hey, thanks for having us. My name is Mele Uker. Um, I'm a doctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Bremen. And I'm currently uh, the coordinator for the web group of the PhD net, but only until end of this term, and then I will hand it over to Andrea. And, oh, sorry. And I'm Andrea Boos, and I'm also a PhD candidate at the evolutionary, wait, MPI for evolutionary biology. Sorry, my brain was silent there. And I will indeed be taking over from Mela um, when she stops her term. So I'm not yet the coordinator. Okay, cool. So you guys are working for the web group, right? So what does this working group actually do? So we are responsible for maintaining the website and the mailing lists and -hmm. also to give support to any group that might need help with something, setting up a new page or anything. Um, So people can just contact us and we handle their requests. Or right now we're working on a bigger restructuring of the website so information is easier to find. We just try to get the information flow. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, the website is one of the most important uh, interfaces between a person and knowledge, right? So uh, how many uh, people are actually actively part in your working group? At the moment, I think it's five active members. And we're also Mm -hmm. working closely together with Connie from the steering group, who's helping us with the website restructuring. Okay. Uh, So, like... How exactly is your like working group organized? Like, do you have uh, one person doing certain tasks repeatedly, or do you have like different uh, people doing the same thing over and over? I would say it's just whoever has time answers mm-hmm. the request, and if you don't have time but you think it's important, you ping yeah. the others. Please, somebody do this. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So it's very free-flowing, like, basically. Yeah, it's not certain persons are responsible for something because mm-hmm. that is also hard to handle. You never know what is up in your real life or your PhD. So whenever you have time, you just can do a task. Sounds a lot how we organize the uh, Offspring podcast sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> or is exactly. that a trade secret? 
No, it's not trade secret. <laughs> I think people know that uh, whatever it is, the PhD still comes first, right? I think that is how most of the work groups work, right? Yeah, most of the working groups have a similar policy, I suppose. So uh, how often do you guys meet in, in the web group? Is it the kind of thing you meet every month, every few months, or is it more email correspondence? It is like a lot of email correspondence. So we have our own Slack where we do stuff on. Um, but most like we've been meeting like once every six months, I think. And at the moment, a bit more for the restructuring. So we have been doing uh, hackathons with like four hours working on the website together. Um, wow. But in general, uh, the meetings are sort of if something needs to be done, just, just check up. But otherwise, once in every six months. It's not that demanding. So maybe I'm a bit ignorant. What do you mean by a hackathon? Um, Good question. Sort of like we just sat together. I I would just say like you if we now study like in high school, people are like sitting together with Skype on and they're just studying together, like with the video and stuff on. And we sort of did a similar thing while working on the website. We had a uh, a Zoom meeting on, and if there was a question, we can like directly ask people, like, how did you do this? In that sense, so it's we called it a hackathon. I'm not sure whether that's the actual name, but that's what we were doing, like a collaborative like, working. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because of these circumstances with using Zoom, otherwise you'd be in the same room, perhaps. I think or... if like we were planning on doing a physical one. A physical meeting, I mean, and then probably we would have done something similar, like physical. But now, because, yeah, the circumstances, we yeah. do it like this. So what what kind of skills do you guys need or have to, like, make a website? Like, again, if this is something I've never had to do. So what goes into actually making a website? So me personally, I think... For starting out or just for joining the web group, there's no skills you need except curiosity that you should have anyways when you're doing a PhD, right? Um, Hopefully. <laughs> because ideally you learn all the skills that you need from the others and while doing it. A lot of it in the program is point and click. So it's like a graphical user interface. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is buggy, so then it becomes useful if you can at least read HTML to figure out where the problem might be. But as it is really a human readable <laughs> language, let's say, um, I think it's quite easy to get into it and by Googling find out what might be wrong. And then there's always your teammates or the general IT of the um, Max Planck Society that can help you out. There's also things we can't change. If they're like really deep in the system, how the website is built, we cannot change it because we don't have access. Mm -hmm. um, but usually I would say it's just looking at details, being interested in technical stuff, trying to learn a lot of different programs because we have editors for the events, the employees, mm -hmm. the mailing list services. It's like a lot of different programs that you get to know. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a side note, you guys also manage uploading the articles to the Offspring blog. So exactly. So if you're into formatting, that's also yeah. great because that is a lot of work. <laughs> and so in your time with the web group, uh, what kind of skills did you guys either come into the web group with or have gained in your time with the web group? Like what have you kind of learned over the time? Mm. I think I definitely got to know another website managing program. Like at my work, we're using a different one than we do in the web group now. Mm -hmm. And it's good to see how different maintenance systems for a website compare. Um, I definitely grew more fond of all these technical things, like just figuring things out and while I go along. But I think it's a lot of personal skills that you develop when working in a team or growing your leadership skills when doing the work. And I think for every member in every group, they might get better organized than the people who are not taking on an extra task next to their PhD because you need to figure out your schedule every once in a while. 
Um, yeah, so I think it's these kinds of skills that you get a lot. Thanks. Okay. So uh, perhaps as like a last few questions. So if I'm a new PhD student and I'm interested to join the web group, are there any requirements? No, just be enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Easy. And, uh, okay. And so where can I find more information on the web group? You can go to the PhD Net website and look at the web group and send us an email and just get in contact. Okay. And you just to make this clear to all the people who are listening, you do not have to be an external representative to be a part of any working group. You anybody exactly. can be a part of a working group. Yeah. So please feel free to apply to Merle and now Andrea for the web group. And we hope they have a good recruitment session in the upcoming uh, general meeting as well. And I think the, with that, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us here thanks for very this much. very short interview. And uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Next up is Linda from the survey group. So, Linda, welcome to the Offspring Magazine, the podcast. And uh, can you please give a brief introduction of uh, yourself and the work group that you're a part of? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Linda. Uh, I work at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. Um, I'm hopefully going to finish my PhD next year. And I've been involved with the survey working group for the last year and a half. Um, yeah. And so. What, what exactly does the survey working group do for people who haven't heard of it? Yeah, so our main task is setting up the yearly survey that hopefully you've seen in your emails uh, in the past few years. Um, so we basically design all the questions. Together with the steering group, we, design, we decide what sort of the hot topics are this year, what are the things that we want to focus on. Like last year, we did mental health and power abuse. Um, this year, it will be most likely COVID and discrimination and these kind of topics. So we choose that. Uh, and then we collect a lot of data uh, and analyze everything to see where the problems are uh, for PhD students, where things are going very well, uh, and where we can help doctoral researchers. This, that sounds actually like quite a lot of work to actually select the questions arrange them, send the survey, and analyze the data. So how many people are actively involved in the survey working group? I have to, it varies a little bit um, because it's such a long-term project and it requires like, different skills for different parts of the, the process. Um, so currently we're about 10 people. Um, we could use some more uh, if anyone is interested, um, especially when it comes to analysis, because this is, uh, I mean, very interesting, but requires quite a lot of work. Um, yeah, it varies a little bit. I mean, making the questions is uh, challenging, but we had a, last year together with Leibniz and Helmholtz, they spent a lot of time really designing a very, very solid base questionnaire, uh, which means that like this year it makes it a lot easier for us. So we have a very good basis to work with, and then we just change the topics uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how is your work group structured? So, do you have certain people doing certain tasks, or is it more free flowing? Uh, I mean, currently it's me in charge of making sure stuff happens. Um, so, I'm officially sort of the head of the group. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have Leah, who's currently the head of analysis, um, as this is such a separate mm -hmm. aspect and I don't code anything. Um, it makes more sense to have someone making sure that that all goes very well. Um, but usually we just sort of, I mean, we meet semi-regularly, especially around this time when there's a lot of work to do, uh, about mm -hmm. like once in two weeks, sometimes once a week. Um, mm -hmm. And later in analysis time, it's maybe like once a month, uh, depending on mm -hmm. how much of a time pressure there is. Um, but people mm -hmm. choose what they want to do. So there's always a whole list of tasks and everyone just volunteers for whatever they feel like doing. Um, okay. Because, like, if you notice, the survey report that comes out every year is very detailed and highly structured. So, 
I have a feeling that you guys have really sort of it's it's almost like writing a thesis based on interviews you guys have done with people, although on specific questions with simple answers. But it, it's it's very detailed. So how do you guys uh, do that? And uh, is there a specific uh, sort of task that you take to write up the survey report in a certain way? Yeah. So usually. I mean, it depends a bit on what people's interests are. So like anyone who joins the group can contribute where they are. Some people really like to contribute on the topics and make sure that certain parts are covered because we haven't covered them in the past. Um, some people just really like to analyze data but hate writing up. Um, but usually it's a bit of a mix of people. So some people that made the questions also really want to make sure it's written up the way it should be. And usually some of the analysis people also get involved in writing up. Um, so this, like last year for the 2019 we were around six like hardcore people that wrote up different sections, uh, mm -hmm. and like we rotated. I would take a chapter, I would write everything based on the data that I got from the analysis group, go back to them again, and be like, ah, so I saw this thing. I kind of want to know if you relate this to this and this, what comes out of that? So it's really a lot of back and forth between whoever likes to write, whoever mm -hmm. likes to analyze. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's really a team effort. Like there's yeah. there's no way we can do this without everyone working together. Um, Definitely. So also I noticed that you guys have very great graphic design. So you you somehow summarize the whole survey results or at least the important salient aspects of it on one page, which goes on all the social media platforms. So how do you guys do that? Uh, we got a lot, lot of help from the steering group for this uh, as well, because they, of course, being active, with all the different members of the Max Planck Society, they know best uh, where are like what the most interesting topics are at the moment, what the most important things are to focus on uh, for us to improve. But also, I mean, if you go through the data and you start looking into all of these things, and we discuss a lot amongst ourselves, automatically you see that certain topics are more important. And I know it's, it kind of mm -hmm. develops naturally, I would say. Um, well, and. I mean, if you yeah. if you look at the report, it's it's the graphics are really incredible. I agree with Serena, but I also think what you were mentioning earlier about it not just being a depiction of the data that you really go into a discussion of what you've seen and you know contextualizing the impact of the results on what it might be for the average PhD student. Like this, this does seem like quite a bit of work. How much time do you think the average member is spending? I don't know, a week or a month to really bring the survey results together. I would say it's really hard to average because people have different levels of commitment. Uh, so I know that Leia, as head of analysis, invested a lot of time. Um, she was sometimes, especially close to writing up the report, spent the whole weekend changing the figures, updating the graphs, all of that. So some people invested a lot of time. Um, but if you're just analyzing and you're sort of active in the analysis part, for example, like a few hours every week, will easily get you there. Um, and I mean, for writing up, for example, like I would just reserve like, I don't know, two or three hours and just sit down go through everything that I had to do and then we would meet again. So it's, yeah, it, it's not a, like a constant activity flow. It's more of a peak and then mm -hmm. sort of dies down. I guess as you get the data out of it. Um, Yes, so we have, we have a peak now because we're collecting all the email addresses to make sure that we can actually send it out in October, hopefully. Uh, then we'll have, like, I don't know, while it's running, there's not that much to do. And then when the analysis comes out, there's a big peak again. Then there'll be Christmas, so nothing will happen for a while. Uh, and then there'll be, like, writing up and more analysis, and that's, yeah, quite a peak as well. So uh, are there any requirements for people to join the survey group should they be interested in certain aspects or are you guys looking to recruit in certain tasks specifically i mean we always really appreciate people that know a bit of programming um especially when it comes to the analysis um i mean we do we do a lot with python so if you have experience with python that's great um but as leia will also always say any coding language works because we have a python script that uh, we already got from the previous group, from Benny, who da which Leia then improved. So it's quite user-friendly in that sense. So even if you don't have a lot of coding experience, it's actually a lot you can do. Um, and to interpret data and to understand and ask interesting questions, you don't need any skills except for curiosity. Um, 
I mean, that's how I ended up in the survey group. I have no coding skills whatsoever, um, but it doesn't mean you cannot contribute. Um, so I think curiosity and just, I don't know, asking the difficult questions um, is all you really need. But yeah, if you can program and you like analyzing data that's relevant for doctoral researchers, that's what we always uh, so, uh, love to again, see. Again, where can I find some more information about the work, this working group? Like, of course, the PhDNet website, but do we have to uh, check out some other places where you guys post the report and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, everything's on the website. I think it's also on Max, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, but honestly, if you're interested, just write an email to the survey dot group at yeah. standard PhD net ending. Uh, I mean, yeah, people usually write that they're interested, whatever like part of the survey they're interested in, or if you don't know, just like, hey, I'm interested, I'd like to contribute. Um, I usually just do like small calls with new members and sort of explain what we do and everyone can ask questions and see what they would like to contribute um, and then join in in the bigger okay. group. So uh, perhaps like I think I'll end, uh, end this with one last question. So how do you stay motivated to do the work that you guys do? Because I can, I can imagine that sometimes just looking at the data and everything, things can get a bit dry and can get a little... Also looking at how the data is turning up it can be a bit disheartening as well to look at it. So how do you guys stay motivated to do the work that you guys do? I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy thing always, um, but especially seeing some of the bad results that we get is actually very, very motivating um, because it reminds me why we're doing this in the first place. Like we all know that at least I have this impression that we all kind of know, oh, some people get paid a lot more than others and some people have way better conditions than others and some people really have terrible supervisors. And But we cannot make any changes or claim any of this unless we have the data to support ourselves. Um, and I run into this as a representatives of my institute themselves, but also just like if you talk about it with friends and some people say, no, it's really not that bad. And I'm like, I have the data to prove it. It is bad. Um, there is a significant pay gap. There are significant problems. Um, so I think seeing the negative results for me personally is very motivating. Um, and also, I mean, if you really don't see the point anymore, the steering group is always a very good uh, <laughs> yeah. motivator. Uh, they're amazing and they do hey. a lot of good stuff for so, us as well. So uh, if any one of you listeners are interested in joining the survey group, please feel free to write to them at survey at phdnet.mpg.d or is it survey.group? Okay, survey.group survey.group, I think. And uh, thanks, Linda. Thanks a lot for joining us. We really appreciate that you did this and uh, hope to see you very soon. Thank you. Next up is Nathan from the Visions in Science Working Group. So Nathan, can you give a quick introduction of uh, who you are and which work group you are coordinating? Yes, so uh, I'm Nathan. I've been doing my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics. I've been working with uh, theoretical astrophysics for the past three years. And uh, this year I'm coordinating the Visions in Science Group. Okay, so uh, what does the Visions in Science Group do? So the Visions in Science group is mostly uh, responsible for the organization of the Visions in Science conference, which is a conference that uh, brings the doctoral researchers of the whole Max Planck Society together in order to discuss relevant topics for science and for the, and for the Max Planck Society as a whole. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, for example, so you guys organize a whole event, right? So because now during COVID times, it's very difficult to organize events where people can physically be present. So are you guys doing something virtual for that? Yeah, so this year we part up with the Planck Academy when we've been organizing this uh, career uh, evolution event that has been taking place for the past three months. Mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't heard about it, please check it out, the social <laughs> network of the PAG Net. And uh, we've been trying to do the same, but it's more like a one year long event. And then last year, we're going to have an in-person event, depending if, if the COVID situation allows us to. Okay. So uh, like how many people are actively part of your working group currently? 
so this year, because uh, we had this problem with COVID-19, uh, we've been doing the work mostly with the Planck Academy, and uh, we've been kind of giving support for the events that they had already prepared for last year, but mm -hmm. kind of uh, just unifying force together. I'm going to speak what happens in a normal year. So sure, the, definitely. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> the Visions in Science group, they have in average 12 to 15 members, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we don't work, we don't meet every week in the first half of the year. But then when the event is is, is getting uh, closer to, to the date, then uh, we tend to, to kind of meet at least twice per, per week. We work in close collaboration with the career fair group also, because normally the events that we do, they're, they're hosted together in the same venue and at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the career fair group is a completely independent group. But uh, we've been thinking of uh, kind of combining them together since the work is always done in collaboration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there like a specific structure to your group? Do you have certain people doing certain things or certain tasks? Or do you have like most people, it, is it more like on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, so again, normally what would happen is that, for instance, last year we organized the N-Square conference. We helped to organize the N-Square conference, right? And uh, inside of the group, we have to divide them in specific tasks. So you have the program committee, you have people responsible for the venue, you have people responsible for marketing, you have the financial department. So those are going to take care of uh, things independently. And then we have a joint meeting where everybody's going to be exchanging ideas telling what are the problems and trying to, to get things working on time. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. So uh, d is that like certain skills that you're looking for? So because you said you have different committees and different people doing different tasks. So are there specific skills that you want people to have before they join the group? Or are these things that they develop as they're a part of the group? I mean, um, if you are pursuing a PhD at the Max Planck Society, I'm pretty sure that you have all the skills that we need to perform the work that we perform. <laughs> uh, it's not the, the financial department is not very complicated. The marketing with social networks is also not very complicated. I mean, you just need to to have this desire to to participate and to integrate the group and to be proactive, and uh, that should mm -hmm. be more than enough. What we offer instead is that uh, we have this hands-on uh, experience with uh, project management, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to deal with stakeholders, you have deadlines, you have the finance that is a constraint that not always, not all of us, we have this kind of a constraints in our PhDs. So really gives us a completely different view about uh, another thing that is an important component of academic life and also not academic life, that is organizing events, man managing a group or project management in general. And uh, mm -hmm. the skills you have, we just have things to offer instead. Okay, that sounds very cool. So on average, let's say close to the time of the event on a normal year, how much time do you spend per week on this or per day on this? Or like, you know, what sort of commitment are we looking for in people who become an integral part of your group? So uh, in the months before the event, I would say that we might spend, depending on how smoothly things run, might spend two hours per week to four hours, depending on what group you are. The mm -hmm. financial department, they don't work that much. People that are involved with the program committee, they work a little bit more, but they are in contact, right, with the speakers, with the companies, and that's somehow good for your networking. Definitely. So there is some sort of trade-off here in the amount of work and the amount of uh, feedback that you get from the organization of the event. Mm -hmm. But in the weeks before the, the event itself, I would say that we would spend uh, up to perhaps 15, 20 hours per week with the organization, two weeks prior to the event, because we have to take a look in the venue, we have to check uh, the catering and all this kind of stuff, we have to take care of everything. And in that case, we need more involvement of most of the other members so we can share the work properly. It also is going to depend on where it's going to be the venue, uh, where most of the people are located, and uh, of course, the amount of students that are going to take place in the, in the event. But in average, I would say that those numbers, they, they kind of hold. Okay. That all sounds very cool. So yeah. if I want to know more about your working group, where can I find the information? Uh, we do have uh, a website inside of, uh, it's hosted the, under the PAZNet uh, main website. You can check mm -hmm. that one. 
Okay. Uh, you can also check the post that was posted by the PG Net on LinkedIn about this kind of a job offer Definitely. for the working group. And uh, yeah, then again, I'm going to re-emphasize that this year things didn't work as much as we were expecting. Uh, but uh, hopefully for the next mm -hmm. year, things are going to go back to normal and people are going to be able to participate just as much as they did last year. Amazing. So uh, is there a specific email address with which people can contact you? Can you, can you uh, highlight that? Yes. So you, you can contact the our careers.evolution at pagnet.mpg.te Okay. Or you could contact me directly, nathan.deoliveira at ipp.mpg.de. Okay. So for all the listeners, we'll be putting all these links in the show notes down below. And if yeah. you're interested to join the Career Steps, uh, Career Evolution team or the Visions in Science team, formerly yeah. known as. So please <laughs> feel free to write to them. And they're very open and they're willing to take new members as in when you're interested to join them. Yeah. And thanks, Nathan. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And yeah, no uh, hope you have a good recruitment session during our uh, general meeting this year. Thank you. And finally, for this episode, we have Barbara from the Equal Opportunities Group. Hey, Barbara, thanks for joining us on this episode of Offering Podcast. Can you give us a quick introduction of yourself and which work group you are coordinating? Hey, so first, thanks for having me. So my name is Barbara. I'm doing a PhD at MPI of biochemistry. And I'm this year's coordinator for Equal Opportunity Work Group of the PhDNet. Okay, so Equal Opportunities seems like an important uh, thing. So can you explain what the EO Work Group does? So basically, the task of our work group is to help to do as much as possible as we can to ensure that each and every one of us is presented with equal opportunities during our PhD. So that goes from, it's not only based on sex, but this also includes the religion, the et et ethnic origin of people. Mm -hmm. uh, language barriers are really important at Max Planck, right? We all know. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, we are a very international society of people here, definitely. So this is something that we are all together trying to work on and improve that all of us are presented with the same baseline. Mm -hmm. So can you explain like how many active members does the working group currently have? So this year is a bit random, as we all know. Yeah. Uh, and depending on the time of the year, I would say we have around 10 to 15 active members. We are all dispersed working on different projects. And yeah. some people are, a lot of people are actually currently finishing that were very active in previous years. So I think there's kind of happening a slowly a generational shift. Mm -hmm. So we are very eager to get new people involved in our work group. Okay. So what does the EO work group actually, you know, do? Like in the sense, they do they organize events as well or do they just create awareness campaigns and stuff like that? Because if I remember correctly, there was recently this uh, awareness campaign for, or no, there was recently this change in the way the names are entered in our salary slips. There is no hair or Frau in the front. And exactly. that was, that was, a, that was an improvement to have a gender neutral uh, naming system, right? So can you guys explain that? So believe it or not, small things like this took a really long time, a lot of paperwork, a lot of negotiating. And this is actually something that uh, Equal Opportunity Work Group pushed really hard on. So over the past year, two years, basically, we had two different work groups basically grow out of equal opportunity and become their own entity, so to say. So it started first with MP Queer. Mm -hmm. So for those, those of you who don't know, MP Queer basically is a group of people, a queer community. We are trying to represent queer community within Max Planck society. 
and this was first initiated by the members of the Equal Opportunity. Similarly, a mental health collective was also initiated by a couple of, of individuals out of Equal Opportunity. So there's a lot of room to grow and there's a lot of topics to cover. So when these topics get really big, we try to kind of, and there's an interest behind it, we also try to put some people really in charge of these topics and then they basically can live on their own. Mm -hmm. So this name change was equally pushed by Equal Opportunity and then it was later also pushed by MP Queer. Mm -hmm. And luckily that that's one small thing that you can as actually physically see that change. So it might not mean a lot to you, but for some people it really means a lot. So Definitely. So can you give a more like detailed description of how your working group is organized? Because you said that there's some part of it which but 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 off to like you know make something more independent also so can you explain how the working groups are organized so where we are very loosely organized uh we communicate over slack channel and there for each interest group so to say we have a specific channel as well uh so whoever has some idea what they want to work on we discuss this on the meeting and whoever else from the group is interested, basically, kind of, you just join whichever project you feel more pa most passionate about, what you feel that you can contribute the most, or what mm -hmm. you're just basically, uh, what's in your interest. Exactly. So where your passions lie, right? Yes. So it's okay. very, so it's very loosely organized. People can do really what they feel passionate about. I think that's really important to have. Also, this kind of a social awareness of what things that are happening around you on the side mm -hmm. of your PhD. Definitely. So how often do you guys meet? So is it like a group meeting where you where all of you meet together once a while? Yeah, so we try to meet once in a while. We had a very nice meeting somewhere mid of June mm -hmm. where we basically just checked out what's the current state, how people are dealing with corona, like who's at home, who's at work. And we discussed a bit what we can actually do in the times like corona. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we cannot organize any events. So mostly we are, whatever we are doing is aimed as, as a virtual awareness campaigns. Uh, mm -hmm. And at the moment we are working on invisible disabilities, mm -hmm. which is also, a, it's a, I wouldn't say a big problem, but it is a, a big topic that it's not really discussed mm -hmm. at all, and especially not in Max Planck society. So we have a lot of PhD researchers and also other employees of the society that do suffer from some kind of invisible disabilities, but then they can be often judged or talked about or looked upon because mm -hmm. people are not aware or they just don't know. Mm -hmm. So this is something for this year, kind of to-do plan, to focus our energies on and try to improve because Mental Health Collective to cover the mental health part, mm -hmm. MP Queer is doing all the queerness part, and then the rest of the work group is focusing on these invisible disabilities. And we are also trying to get rid of the survey group. We are trying to get a better idea what's the general... Mm -hmm. atmosphere among PhD researchers when it comes to disabilities and discrimination that they face at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you guys look out for a certain, like any requirement in people when they join the working group or do you just want them to be extremely passionate about the cause? Well, you cannot demand someone to be extremely passionate, but it's it's really nice to have uh, similar, similarly minded people and that they share their passions and then that's really what gets things going so if, you've, if you're bothered by something I would say that you're passionate about this issue and then if you see something happening at your Max Planck you're not happy about it mm -hmm. you can come and join us and we can try to fix it together I think the only requirement is that people to be reliable. So, so if you join and you say you do something, mm -hmm. like you stand your ground and you actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, as I said, we are very loosely organized. Whatever you feel passionate about, we can work on it. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. 
So uh, can you uh, give some information about where we can find more information on your working group? So we also have a page on PhDNet. You can mm -hmm. find a contact there. You can also write us at equal.opportunity at phdnet.mpg.de. Or you can write to me if there's something urgent or you just don't feel comfortable writing to the mailing list. Mm -hmm. And please feel free to join us. You can also just be a visitor in our group to see how things are working. So please feel free to come and join us. You can also just check out how you're working and you will not be forced to do anything. Don't worry. Uh, you can pick your own battles. Okay, that all sounds great. So thanks a lot for joining us, Barbara. And if you're interested to join the Equal Opportunities Working Group, please feel free to check out the links in the show notes below. Okay, so those were the first four working groups for this episode of Offstream Magazine, the podcast. So if you are interested in any of these four working groups, please feel free to write to them. The links to all of their mailing lists is down in the show notes. And if you're interested to know more information, please check out the working group page on the Max Planck PhDNet website. And as you might have noticed, each working group has a specific role to play and a specific task to accomplish. And this is what keeps the Max Planck PhDNet running in such smooth fashion, as you might have understood from the steering group episodes and as well as from the working group episodes. So each working group has an important role to play. And if you're interested in any of these, make sure to uh, check them out on the PhDNet website. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening to this rather fragmented episode. And I apologize for the next one. It's going to be very similar, where we're, we're going to be interviewing uh, members from four other working groups as well. So stay tuned for that next week. And the general meeting is coming up very soon. It's coming up from November 4th to November 6th. So if you haven't signed up to be a part of the general meeting, the link is floating around and your external representative should have sent you the link by now. So if not, go to them and ask them, hey, where's the link to register? Anyway, with that, I'll leave you guys. I wish you a very peaceful week forward and I hope you stay safe, stay healthy. Please practice safe social distancing and thanks a lot for listening. Oxford Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the Science Communication Working Group on the Oxford Magazine. The intro outro jingles composed by Srinath Ramkumar and the pre-intro jingles composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. The podcast series is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar, Nicola Herman, Alison Lewis, Adrian La Hoya, and Sandra Fendel. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de. And with that, I will see you next week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and bye!